Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out today to our colloquium. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andalita Sayans Ludlow, and I'm going to give a short biographical on her. Um, she got her bachelor's in mathematics and physics from Pedagogical National University in Columbia, and then she earned a master's degree at State University of New York at Fredonia in mathematics. And then she came to Georgia right here in the University of Georgia to get her EDD in mathematics education. Um, and she's been teaching mathematics um, in the mathematics department for uh, the last 23 years at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And she does research and publishes articles as well as been involved in editorial work um, in the area of semiotics, and so you can check out her in the latest um, book series um, published by Sense Publishers. Go and check out that work, it's very interesting. Um, enjoy getting to know her today and thank her for coming and, and spending her time with us. This is her first time back to Athens, I found out, and so I'm really glad to welcome her back. Really excited to have her here. Um, and so, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to her. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And, uh, so we would like to talk about um, the diagrams are conceptualizing tools in the classroom, and I would like to make the argument that yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's see how. Uh, let's start just with something uh, simple. Once conceptualizing, you know, it's not so simple. It depends on what an external reality, the concepts that are out there. There is an internal reality, our own cognitive structures. There are these things out there, these things that we see. There are the things that, that we represent, in this particular case, through language. And there that that we conceptualize. Um, so there is a lot of interpretation and subjectivity and objectivity that intertwine in order to get to a particular concept uh, that is not that we always think that we know or we don't know it. It's like we can do it a little, you know, we refine that. Um, so let's see what is learning in terms of experience experience in learning. And that comes from a very interesting book from learning as awareness. And, um, and they say very clearly that learning as experience is something that we see it today in the class is a way of going about learning. Is the learning is the learning's how aspect. And the object of learning is the what aspect. Now, um, what is interesting, and that comes from some uh, um, Chinese program that they give us in Igme, uh, Igme uh, I think it was called, in South uh, Korea, of how uh, it reflects how much the culture and religion influence their ways of teaching and learning in those cultures. And it says, it's clear that more or less refers to learning as experience, that one discovers one's deficiencies through learning and one's difficulties through teaching. In recognizing one's deficiencies, one is able to reflect on oneself and overcome difficulties, and one is able to develop one, oneself. Therefore, it said that teaching and learning are mutually enhancing. And it has to do with learning as experience. And, and how much as teachers do we know, and how much of our students we expect that they know. And here is something that, in the same book, Learning as Experience, uh, they have this chart that caught my attention because all of us said, like, oh, I don't want them to you know? And, uh, but there are, they, I love that classification of how we learn and how deep we can learn. We can memorize words, we can memorize meanings, 
we can understand minutes or we can understand the whole phenomenon. Now, and the what is learning, we can acquire, we can be knowing, or we can make it, uh, or we can make it use of. So memorizing, we can memorize the words and we can remember them or reproduce them and we know what happened when we just memorize words. But we can memorize also minutes and we can remember those minutes and we can reproduce those minutes. Going deeper, gaining understanding, gaining meanings, understanding meanings, being that mean being able to do something, being able to do something differently, clear things, change it there, or being able to do something different, being able to, uh, uh, in another way. You know, that, that catches another way of doing things. And, um, and having that understanding, gaining that understanding more deep, more deep at the phenomenon, understanding, having understanding, and relating that understanding. That means like seeing all the concepts in a systematic way, in a related way. So here comes science. What is a sign? For a long time, uh, and, and we're still continue to be, continue to be just kind of mystery, less of a mystery now after Peirce. And there are many different theories of signs since Aristotle's, and it's something that has been in the minds of the great minds. What is this business about signs? Um, we call it sign. I say we because we are uh, my, uh, myself and an mathematician wrote an article about interpreting pairs and interpreting how we can use um, pairs in the classroom. And there are some notations um, and some denominations that he uses, and um, he really confuses us <laughs> somewhere. Because everything looks like the signs, and we will go to the sign vehicle, the vehicle, or the interpretant, or the object, or what. So we decided, like, let's put that in capital letters. Because the sign is complicated. It's a real, it's a system of three things. It the sign, and, and the real letter is the sign vehicle, or is the sign interpretant, or is the sign object. And we are going to go into the sign interpretant because it's where we can see, usually it is a, a Syrian uh, theory of signs. Uh, uh, it takes into account the sign vehicle and the sign of it. But it leaves behind that idea of sign interpreter. What is the sign interpreter? Those ideas that, we, that the interpreter generates in his or her mind. And so here is, Loudly and clearly, pairs admitting the subjectivity within the objectivity of the sign object that the sign vehicle intends to represent. So, by having those three elements, immediately there are in there three dyadic relations between the sign vehicle and the sign object, the sign vehicle and the sign interpreter design interpreter and design object. So we are talking about diagrams. Let's see if it's more clear. Yeah, seeing that in a diagram. We have a sign object, we have a sign interpreter, and we have a sign vehicle. And so there are those three dyadic relationships that once one is there, the other ones appear simultaneously. And um, now the sign object, it's not that we get it or we don't get it, it's that we get it little by little and we refine it. Like what we saw today in class, it was like, uh, well, the, the kids are getting there. Can you go in another way, you know? Can you get in another context? Just get a little bit in another way. Just make relationships in here. Um, so um, now people are going to 
on the ground. That's I'm vehicle. I'm in Kent. This is an old story there. I love that chart that he has in that book for the psychology of learning mathematics. Because he admits that perception is important, that the sense organs as important, that there is a, he called it symbol system. I will call it notational systems. Uh, uh, because we see that symbol uh, in the same, in, in Perse's theory, he reserves the, the symbol as the name for something very sophisticated, as a sign because very sophisticated, as the result of a lot of interpretation. And he has the conceptual structure, what he calls the deep structure. So, in a way, what he is saying in there, there is a set of symbols. There is a set of concepts. There is a set of relationships between the symbols. And there is a set of relationships between the concepts. It's like in mathematics. You have a set, you have the relationship that you want to have there, then you have the system. We have a system of real numbers or, or, or any other system of numbers. And so we call it the surface structure, that symbol system, and then the other one, the deepest structure. So practically, if we compare what these people are talking about, learning as awareness, is getting into the deepest structure of the system. And here we go on more or less the same chart, like uh, it doesn't matter if it's a cap or it's a triangle. All what you see here, whoop, all what you see here is one particular triangle. We don't see all the triangles in the world, we just see a particular triangle. We call it triangle, you know, and we just say it's triangle. Somehow we just have those three sides in there. Um, and, and everyone makes their own, have their own internal uh, reality about the triangles, and they generate different dynamic objects, though that appear in there, called, pairs call them dynamic objects. And there is a lot of subjectivity and objectivity uh, intertwined in there. Now, one of the types of sign vehicles that uh, pairs talks about uh, and Pears influenced many of people, among other people, Brunner. And he talks about the iconic relations, the indexical relations, and the symbolic relations. And here, it's a sign vehicle. And as a vehicle, it's a sign to, to intends to represent an object that we cannot see with the senses, that we can see only in our minds. Uh, and so the iconic relationship, and that for this one, Pets is very famous for the, the redefinition of the iconic uh, uh, sign vehicle as it is for the, uh, the notion of interpreting as the third element of the sign. So in this iconic relationship, there is, uh, there is uh, an aspect of uh, similarity there something that you see and something that you don't see. Uh, and this iconic rela uh, relation could be an image, could be a metaphor, or could be a diagram. Uh, those metaphors, it depends how they are interpreted and what they are good for. And that's another area. And what is the diagram? And uh, in essence, what he says is a diagram is an icon similar to the object. In which sense? In the sense that the relations among the parts of the diagram is the skeleton of the relations among the parts of the object. So the object is not so simple, whether mathematical, optical, or any other object. It has many aspects. And what we conceptualize um, are um, at a time are certain aspects of the object. And uh, while we grow in our refinement of that object, what we do is to differentiate and integrate the different aspects of the object. And the more that we differentiate and integrate, and we only do it with time, 
uh, the more refined our object become. And so he had different objects. He has an immediate object, dynamic objects, and what he called a uh, final object, which almost never happened, and therefore is going to be an infinite semiosis. An indexical relationship between that sign vehicle and the object is a cause-effect relationship. And uh, we always say, well, the fire and the smoke. Yeah, but there is an equation, and what is what the equation is indicating? Uh, so, uh, and the symbolic relation in general, and all, always also the indexical relation going to, do we have indexes in the classroom? Oh yeah, because anytime that we give a particular example, well that is an indexical relation. It's one of so many in which we expect the students to get the general from the particular. Some of them are fast to get there and some no. So we need another context, we need another example. And the symbolic relation that comes up after many cycles of interpretation is an abstract relationship between the sign vehicle and the such object that hinges on mental operations. Um, so the idea here is, so the diagram he says, it's an iconic relation, okay? And it's an icon of possible relationships, he says, like, well, okay, and it is going to become an indexical relation or not. And it's going to become a symbol, and to whom? So, in general, a sign vehicle, we say, oh, the sign vehicle could be an icon, an index, or a symbol. Well, we forget to say, for who? So for the teacher, whatever we are explaining could be already some type of symbol, but for the student, it could be a simple token, you know, like, I don't know what to do with that. Um, so what the diagrammatic uh, reasoning is, and it has been studied by the Sternfeld by years and years, using pairs, he argued that in a diagram, by interpreting the diagram, by manipulating the diagram, by thinking about the diagram, we come to transform that diagram from being just a simple token that we say, like, what am I going to do with that? You know? uh, to being an index and to being a symbol. So like the diagram, like any other um, side vehicle, could be an index or could be a symbol, it depends. For who? So, and in here is when he goes, Perth goes in general, these are my words interpreting him, uh, <coughs> that that, um, that similarity, he, he really puts more into that similarity. Since Aristotle, the icon was always some type of uh, representation similar to the other. Okay. But here he comes and says, diagram is an icon, an icon of possible relations. He opens the window. Possible for whoever wants to interpret it and unveil. Uh, uh, that could be unveiled, could be, no might be, or should be. Uh, but um, through interpretation. And that interpretation are all these interpreters that we generate. And those interpreters are of all kinds. Could be very emotional, could be very logical, to be, to be uh, dynamic, could be immediate. Uh, and these similarities, um, oh, that the diagram is an icon of possible similarities. Of the diagram points out to similarities between its own structure and the abstract and hidden structure of the object that the diagram purports to represent. These similarities weren't the interpreter's purposeful observation, perceptual and intellectual of the structural relations among the parts of the diagram 
to infer the structural relations among the parts of the object. And we are going to see that in some examples. Through observation, and I love this idea of thought experimentation uh, uh, that comes from Kerstow, uh, they interpret the uh, transitions from an object as it is perceived to the conceptualization of an approximation of an object as it is conceptualized by means of inferential reason. That compares its abduction, induction, and deduction. Through observation and experimentation, the interpreter transforms the diagram from being an icon for him or her to being an index that indicates particular relations among the parts of the diagram to being a symbol of his or her own approximation of the object as it is conceptualized by the interpreter. And so here is then for completely and they're like, what happened with these diagrams? So it has the whole book, and not only one book, it has volumes and volumes of books about diagrammatology, which has been uh, very influential in different areas of, uh, of sciences, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, uh, to transform a diagram, a diagram is a symbol. If, if somebody gives us a diagram, like let's say a graph, uh, a graph, if a graph is a diagram, uh, it already has, for a person who says the sine function or the cosine function for the first time, to be like, a, okay, very nice, it's a good one there, go like, oh, Nice, up and down, up and down, up and down, and it repeats. Well, if they must have done it, they repeat the same as we go all over again. But anyway, we made the notice that. And, and, and uh, for that person, it's a symbol. But for the poorest student, it's like, what does it mean? <laughs> Very nice. And we tell them, oh, this is the music of mathematics. And remember what the teacher said, I say, oh, really? I, I cannot hear that. I might be deaf. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then you transform that. The interpreter mentally refurbishes the diagram due to, to his or her uh, evolving interpreter, which are added by his collateral knowledge. And the collateral knowledge is not what we call in mathematics education, trivial knowledge. In other words, uh, is collateral knowledge trivial knowledge? Yes. Is all previous knowledge collateral knowledge? No. Because it's collateral knowledge to the situation that you have at hand. There are many things that are true, but we don't bring them into the situation. You know, I have to prove this, and then you don't bring like, oh, I know this, I know this. But yeah, there are many things that are not going to move you where you want to go. So that collateral knowledge, the one that you have, make it, you have to make a judgment. What is what I'm going to bring to the situation of those things that I know that is going to help me, that are going to move me along the goal that I have, and I suppose you have. You have a, a, where do you want to go? Or go, where do you want the, 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 the proposition push you to go? And, uh, and so it, it, um, it goes into different types of interpreters, which I'm not going to do that today, but it's my papers. Uh, um, that with those interpreters, uh, the diagram passes from being indexical and it starts seeing from the particular aspects of that particular diagram that is very particular and very singular, the general aspects of, of the object. And uh, by means, later on, by means of mental operations, the interpreter starts seeing the symbolic aspects of the diagram. His or her logical interpreters, the logical in the sense for him, regardless of being a logician, for him, logical interpretants are those that make sense, that, make, that have some type of connection, that interpret that hinge, hinge on uh, mental operations to unveil certain aspects of the object from the relationships among the parts of the diagram. Now, the diagram is seen as a diagram symbol representing representing an object as it is progressively in, uh, conceptualized. 
here we are. Here is, uh, I love that book about the uh, proof without words. Like, what am I going to do with it? You know? And that moment for us, it's, it's a nice token, you know? Like, yeah, I have to, let's see what happened here. I love that, the, that diagram. Because, look, when I still feel like that, how, how am I going to put that in there? Like, we don't do that. I mean, we just do that when I'm not always in a standard position, and we just play with our components, and then we just say, this is it. But in here, look, that, it's a case of abduction. For the person that proposes that diagram, it's a case of abduction and not just any abduction. We are going to see that abductions are not all the same. But this is a case of creative abduction. Yeah, really. A concept, I have it there and suddenly I see something very visual that I can put it here and make this. And look, it's just a rectangle. And somebody just partitioned that into dry triangles nicely and then put here the one and then two angles and then or oh, oh, this is angle alpha and angle beta and this angle beta again and angle alpha and my one and you want me to say this like that and so okay that's a diagram token from the time here okay and let's see but from now on the, the next one is like a I'm going to push you all the way, okay? But I'm going to give you one example in there, but you are going to make the other, the other uh, proof. But, uh, so, here, uh, don't think that appear too fast, you know, you have to start like, oh really, where does alpha appears again? Like, how many right triangles are here? Oh yeah, all the trigonometric functions, there are six, but there are the six only possible relationship ratios that I can make among the size of the triangles. And like, oh, that's very nice. Well, let's see what I have in here. At least let's start with the angles. Okay, so suddenly like, oh, this one and this one. Oh, yeah, this size, but can be correct that one and that side. Oh, yeah, yeah, they are the same, correct? So that alpha repeats in here. Uh, their sides are perpendicular among themselves. Like, oh, well, with this alpha, this is beta. This has to be alpha plus beta, correct? Right? And these sides, as far as we know, it's parallel to this one. Yes? And this plays the role of that transversal. And so that angle and that angle are uh, congruent, correct? Uh, so, and so like, oh yeah, how nice. Oh, and this is one. Oh, sure enough. This is the opposite side to this, this is the adjacent side to this. Sure. Oh yeah, that's cosine of alpha to that beta. And this is sign of alpha plus beta. Like when we are going somewhere, you know, it's just one rectangle. Yeah, you see what I mean? This one diagram is so particular there. Like, and then like uh, now, what am I going to do with the rest? <laughs> like, 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 like. Uh, okay, let's start in here. But fortunately, my one is there, you know. <laughs> so I can say that. Oh, you are opposite to me. You are sign of beta. You are adjacent to me. So you are cosine of beta. So like, okay. And then like, um, oh, look at this other one. Oh, so this is not cosine of alpha. I have to multiply it by cosine of beta, correct? This is r cosine, cosine of alpha, cosine of beta. And this is not only cosine of alpha, I have to multiply it by cosine of beta, okay? And uh, so suddenly, oh, this segment, cosine of alpha, mm -hmm. cosine of beta. That's very nice. And we know that uh, this repeats in here, and, and this is a right triangle, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And then the hypotenuse, and so the opposite side is the sine of alpha, which I have multiplied by the sine of beta, and this is the adjacent side of so the cosine of alpha, which I have multiplied by the sine of beta. So I'm like, uh, mama, what am I going to do with that? Like, oh. Okay. Oh, I remember that I have this, so the segment, correct? You see how we are going to transform that little by little. It wasn't like that in our mind, and we were like, what am I going to do with that? So that diagram had been changing in our minds, correct? Uh, now, now I'm telling you by the hand, you know, I, I, when you are alone, you have, you have to really think about that a little bit. It's not like that. And 
and then we have that and that. I feel like, ooh, okay. So I have the whole segment, partial segment, and those two segments are the same. Like, oh, I know who you are. You are the difference between those two segments, right? And I have the segment and the segment, so, oh, I know who you are, correct? But I also know who you are. Yeah, come. Go. Okay? And uh, so that's, that's the diagrammatic reasoning. Is there abductions in there? Or they, what, the initial one is the abduction of the proposer, very creative. We just, <laughs> the, the proposer, like, you know, this is an icon and an icon of possible relationships. Do the thing yourself. And uh, the other ones, you have to work on those. So they are abductions too, but they are undercover. So you have to work, it's, it's a big deal, but it's not such a big deal like transforming that, like, oh, okay, here you are going to find a relationship on this rectangle. They're not that look so simple. And um, uh, so let's see the other one. So it's the same game. So this is, if this is alpha, this is beta, this is alpha minus beta. And this is my beautiful one here, very helpful. And this is cosine of alpha minus beta because it's the adjacent, and this is sine of alpha minus beta. And then this is, uh, uh, it, it reproduces in here because these two sides are parallel, and this is the transversal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then this reproduces in here because of perpendicular sides, corresponding perpendicular sides. And now we are on my way with the same thing. Yes? But you see the transformation of this diagram. And that's what is called diagrammatic thinking. Now, along the way, we generated several interpretants that uh, some of the, at the beginning, was kind of emotional. I don't know, like, uh, what am I going to do here? And it's just, are there and sometimes they stop because they think we never show that we in the classroom we also we always show them the result of our thinking. So they think that we are geniuses. <laughs> but we never teach them how to think about that. And so the students have that language, you know, like I cannot study a little like that. Yeah. We, we never, we never show that part to the students, you know, like, oh, I find my classes very well, so I'm not doing very well, so you're going to listen to me. And besides that, you're going to keep quiet, correct? You're going to listen to me. So the only one that has the opportunity to talk to ourselves is us, you know? And therefore, we are reflecting on uh, the whole, the, 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 the proverb, the Chinese proverb there. You are reflecting, you are improving yourself, and you are quietly and hiding that from the students, you know? <laughs> That's a real conceptual logic, you know? <laughs> like, that's the mystery of teaching and learning, you know? It's the real show. Uh, and so, uh, let's see another one. I love this one, too, okay? But look at the one. I, it comes from there. Uh, and you have to play with, with second and tangent, you know, in here. Uh, and, and you will get there. You just transform your diagram and 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 get the same the same game. Uh, but here you can you can play very well with secam and tangent um, because tangent will be this one and you the the opposite of the radiation, nice one. And, and also we could also change that one. Uh, we can change this one or here or here. And that one here or here or or uh, maybe change the old one here or here and the relationship whatever they are we are getting there they are not exactly the same but we are getting there so yeah there are a lot of abductions uh, but all of them are not the same. So since first I've been looking about abduction and being part of what he calls inferential reasoning, which could be or abducted, very creative, and then inductive and uh, deductive, not necessarily in that order. But um, yeah, so other people that are saying like, 
Yeah, although abductions are not the same, you know. They are the creative abductions, but they are under current abductions, that's what we were doing. Like, what am I going to do here? Or it could be that there's different possibilities to do something, and you have to choose among them. And here it is, it always amazes me that I don't know, I have to submit, you know? But I, I have to see all these things. All the students remember that the sum of the angles of the triangle is 190 degrees. All of us remember that. How to prove it? And, and they always give us the auxiliary construction. <laughs> Once you have that, I remember I said, the geometry, I said, well, all I have to memorize the auxiliary construction because after that, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> like every single thing I have to fall in place. That auxiliary construction, that's the abduction. And in the history of mathematics, there are only three proofs. And if you look at any, any uh, that the sum of the angles of the triangle are 190 degrees. And if you look at the books, uh, only two are, are shown in there, not the last one, that problem that he wrote, uh, the commentaries of, of Euclid's books. And, uh, but let's look at where are the abductions? Where are they coming from? What they were thinking? Because, and in that article I analyzed, what type of proposition is mathematically according to Kant, and how difficult it is to prove this proposition, because it's not like, if this happened, then this happened, you know? Like, oh, this they give me the beginning, you know? But in every triangle, at some of the angles, there are 180, where am I going to start? In every triangle, thank you very much, but that's not too much, you know? And, um, but in here, it's all like, today will be nice to see this part that comes from the article. That, where are the actions? What were those people thinking? What are the relationships like? What am I going to do with this? How much are, they, are those angles? And suddenly, oh, it's straight angle. You know? Like, oh, that's 180 degrees. Oh. Look, this is very early. We're not talking on gradients. We're not talking the degrees. And like, uh, oh, is there any relationship between that straight angle and, and the 180 degrees of the triangle? Like, maybe. Um, so they, this is my analysis of what they could be thinking about to do that. And then, what is the synthesis of the probe and how they got to the conclusion? And yeah. And they did it in different ways. Let's see how they did it. So what Pythagoras did, or the Pythagorean, he made a line in here, you know, parallel to this one. I'm not, that's the abduction. I mean, because he had something in mind already. It's not like God, they said like, yes, we're on the line, and then we know the whole thing about the angles and that. Good job done. What the big deal in here? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, parallel, parallel, transversal, parallel, parallel, transversal, dun, 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 dun. Therefore, some of the elements of the train, not 180 degrees. Done. Now, Euclid, he was more sophisticated, <laughs> and he loved to introduce new concepts. So, introduce the concept of the external angle. That was not needed, really. But, so it's a, like that, okay, and he tell us like, you extend this side, and then with this side here, you form the external line. Forget about this line. So you, st you extend one of these sides, and you go here, get to that vertex, and you have that. And then he said, I was working with parallel lines, so parallel this to this, so it said like, ooh, nice, parallel. Parallel, parallel, different verbs are there. You and you are congruent. And so like parallel, parallel, and this transversal. And so this angle and this angle are congruent because they correspond. And so it's a well, these are the external angles, so the external angle is the sum, sum of the two remote angles. And we are there, and then he said, oh, by the way, that is close to the other angle. And you know what? 
that is a straight angle. Therefore, the sum of the angles of the straight angle is 180 degrees. Well, Proclus has more time uh, to think about that. <laughs> right in the commentary, it's like, let's see, maybe some other way, you know, like, uh, what the heck? It has to do with parallels. All the parallelograms have to do with parallels, and here's a triangle, and I can have lines, and I can make parallels whatever I want to, so what the heck? Like, make parallel lines. So let's choose one point, whatever, whoever in this, whatever place in here in this side, for parallels in here, um, or a beautiful parallelogram. I preserve this line in here also. Uh, it could be a median or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it's like, oh, so let's see what happened. So these two are parallel. And, um, and this is a transversal, so uh, which angles are going to be congruent? Angle 2 is going to be congruent with angle 3. And angle 1 is going to be congruent with angle 2, two uh, for the same reason. So it's like, OK. And um, here we have this line, and we have this line parallel to this line. So these and these are congruent because they are corresponding. And for the same reason, this is parallel to this, this and these are congruent. So these two angles are congruent with these two, and this is congruent with this one, and this is congruent with that. And bingo! I made another right angle. Uh, right angle, a straight angle. So. 180. I mean, that proposition is so unique in mathematics. And can't analyze that. Uh, and, and why and like, what type of proposition that is. And uh, they should, once you have the, the auxiliary construction, that is the very, and these are abductions that are very creative because they made a connection between the straight angle and the sum of the angles. Uh, one thing that we could teach the students in, in, uh, in geometry is give them the hint, like, and let's see, it's, it's start where they start, you know, undercover, and they're like, what we could do? What do we know about parallel lines? You know, that parallel lines are wonderful. They made parallelograms, and from them all the quadrilaterals and every single thing, that what we can learn from there because the truth of the matter is that all of us remember the proposition, we don't remember how to prove it. Um, and that, all that is also diagrammatic thinking, the, the proofs of that. And uh, what this Sternfeld said is like, it could be that you have the premises in that particular case of this proposition, but like very general. But you construct a diagram, and then by observation and manipulation, you play and play with play, you transform your diagram into an icon weakness, and then take some type of conclusion to a generalization. And look at what happened with, with the cosine of alpha plus, plus or minus alpha beta, and the sign of the sum of different of two angles, that from that particular situation, you go into something general. But it's very singular. And it's a representation, and there are the, th uh, the type of abductions that the students can go through. So yeah, we can we can create an argument in there, um, and that's the idea that the diagram helps us to create a mathematical argument. It's a logical argument. It's the the the, the, the result of uh, different chain of logical interpreters. Uh, and, and the whole argument, as far as we know, we make the arguments and proof things because we like to conceptualize those subjects through those proofs. And in one way or another, that's why it's so implicit in learning and in experience in learning. Uh, the Chinese say, 
learning without salt is like a lot. Uh, we memorize like that. Okay, you will forget. Other people say, uh, there's another way of saying that. You memorize, you forget, uh, uh, I don't remember what, but it's the same idea. Uh, so without learning, it's probably with that. Uh, the Kant says, perception without conceptualization is blind, and conceptualization without perception is empty. And that is, for me, that, that, that whole book about uh, proofs without words, that's what people do, have something conceptualized and they decide to put it in a very perceptive way. So other people can do something with that and have that and conceptualize their opinions. And Arhan, which is uh, uh, dedicated the whole book about visual thinking that has been very influential, said practically parallel in Kant, he said vision without abstraction is blind and abstraction without vision is empty. So Arhan wanted to make emphasis on all the perceptions, the visual part, the visual aspect of all the perceptions that we have with our five senses. Now, what is the diagram? Diagram, a map is a diagram. A map is a, one of those that we saw before. A chart is a diagram. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, probably you don't remember because I don't know if you have the dollar push to do that. But in my time, we just made uh, what we call them synthetic charts, you know? So we do the we word review for the final exam, because we have final exam. We have to study the whole year, not one semester. <laughs> we have several tests and tests and tests. I mean, are we learn it or we learn it. <laughs> we have to be genius. So we just have to be uh, doing the work that we have to do, OK? And, and at the end, uh, it, we just like, oh, we just are seeing the connections, you know, like, oh, this is connected with that. I was one of those that I was even making corrections in the books, you know, like, oh, no, I don't see that. It doesn't make sense. Maybe it's a typo or something like that. And then, uh, fortunately, I put them in pencil, you know, and then everybody like, oh, oh yeah, now it makes sense, you know, it's, it's clear. Now it connects with this for that reason they put it there. but. You got there, you know, at least you contradicted them for some time, and then you get, like, oh, no, no, they were right, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, but here, uh, a, I'm on, oh, a map, a map is a, is, a, is, is a diagram. That's why the anthropologists said, say, very, uh, very to the point, the map is not the territory. And I would say design vehicle is not the concept. And then we take it like, okay, here are all the formulas in there. But there are something like, oh, no, 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 no. These sign vehicles are not the concept that's the same way that the map is not the territory. And we have many charts. This is come from NCTM, which I found very useful. Because that concept of functions is not very, I mean, we teach in different ways, because we never get there and only at once. I have not done any research in the uh, historical development of function, but I, I, I think I'm going that way. <laughs> like, uh, how did the develop, how did people talk about that? Because in here, uh, the teacher goes and says something, you know, and then the next time, the teacher goes and gives another definition. Uh, God knows the other. We don't, we don't describe functions in only one way. We have described functions in many ways. And the editor did all the labor and put all those things together. So like, how mad is, you know? Because, yeah, that, that's why I said, like, synthetic chart. Uh, for the, at this moment, I think it's pretty good. I don't know what I'm going to think in, in, in three years or four years when I go over it. But, no, and, and look how we describe it as a relationship between input and output. Like, uh, which is very kind of visual, you know? Where am I going to put my input there? Where, where is my output is going? I don't see it. Where should I put it there? Uh, uh, the function, uh, the, in, in a function, the output depends on the input. And by the way, right? you, are not, you are not as old as I am. <laughs> but in the 60s, 
the French came with the idea, with the set theory and the whole thing. And the, the, here comes the machine, you know, they were all imposed by the French. And uh, so we were in like in, in middle school, or, uh, and so we had to study all of that, like, okay, set theory now. And so there it comes, all the, and the function is a relationship in which when each element in the domain is there, which exactly one element of the range. And the students do not know where to look. If we go into a graph, they have no idea. They say, if the domain and the range is all the real numbers, they have no idea. They say the real numbers, they don't have in their minds if they go to the horizontal or the vertical. I said, that doesn't matter. So the real numbers is correct. And we grade it correct. I mean, I real, I mean, and it's happened to realize, what are they thinking? Where is that? Is? You know, because for all the mistakes that they make in the other problems. And a function is order pairs, suddenly order pairs, you know? The fact that it was not a relationship by order pair, right? It still satisfies the condition that there are not two order pairs uh, uh, with the same input and different outputs. So we love the input output uh, words. A function is a rule that assigns each element of a set a unique element. Looking at that, we say f of x equal. And here we don't say it's a rule, but we never mention an equation or anything like that, you know? Because the equal symbol is, <laughs> all the equals are not the same. Uh, so uh, the function is a rule, the function is a mapping that corresponds and the real value, this one, it's very nice, uh, the, quant the relationship between quantities. And still, it seems like the input and output. But do the students really realize that all those definitions come to understand the same way? And I would say these um, definitions or ways of describing the function are scientific. The question is, do we see the connection among those definitions? There's nothing wrong among those definitions. Whether you put a or we want to make fun of the put or put, it doesn't matter, but they are correct. But uh, do you realize that? No. It's, it's the concept that is, after fractions, is very well misunderstood. Uh, and, and we realize that when we look at the, the uh, inverse functions and the um, and the inverse with respect to multiplication. Like that that is when we come to know that they don't understand what a function is. And and then the symmetries, it, it doesn't make any sense to them. And so really it, it it we have to question ourselves. What is what we are not teaching them? Because they have them in our hands. And so the fact that the same thing, the same uh, Chinese uh, proverb, that we need to think about how our own self, what is what we understand? It's not that we know it all because we just give an answer. No, how we reflect, do we see the connections? Uh, um, what is the type of task that I'm going to choose to make my students to make connections? Uh, so teaching and learning is not that easy because it requires a lot of self-introspection of our own knowledge. Here is a chart. I'm going to represent for a different kind of class. And uh, first, I decided to go with all of our functions and maybe transformations and then repeat the same thing again. Here is what we are going to Repeat and repeat again. Here is what we are going to look at. We are going to transform that. We are going to find the domain. We are going to find the range. We are going to see if it's a crease or the crease. And all that stuff. These students, and with you, if you give the students to transform a function, they, they, they are good, very good, to tell you how many transformations you make in a function. And if they are horizontal or they are vertical. OK? Pretty good. The general. And you give them, well, the function, the point two or three is on this function, and which point should be in the function that has to be, that has been transformed this way. But the particular, the most particular thing, conclusion, no understanding. Now, 
what I like on the chef, I'm very proud of the chef, <laughs> because it shows very clearly we have we have the function notation, but we also have the older pairs, and if they observe very clearly there, when we are making a horizontal transformation, the only thing that we are transforming is the first coordinate, the independent variable. Because to that independent variable, whatever we move it left or right, or, or, or we extend it or we shrink it, then we get the same functional value. That's what the center must realize, that we, that we are given the same functional value. Instead, when we do it, the vertical transformation, what we are transforming are the functional values. The independent variables stay put. Now, you are doing one at one, well, you have to. You have to do it one at a time, or do them at the same time, okay? Oh, I would recommend my children do one at a time, you know? And, and then do the other one. Um, and then when we go to transformations of uh, trigonometric functions, that is very important, just to see the function in that way. Um, so that is an example of a diagram. I love this one. Because we give the students a says, long and singular identities, and they ask, do we have to memorize all of that? <laughs> like, like, yeah. Well, but we have to help them to memorize that. So it's like that. I just start like, here, here, here. Don't forget that. This is the difference in here. You are not going to add those two, OK? <laughs> and, and then in here. Now, do they realize? that I have the double and the half. They don't. And if I ask them like, okay, now follow the pattern and write sine of 4x in that form. Or sine of, of um, x in that form. They don't realize that if, if this is x, it should be x over 2 and x over 2. Yes? And they should be x over 2 and x over 2. Well, once we have it there, we have this and we have this. Same story. So it's about helping them to see the relationships in there, to see the pattern. What we are talking about is about talking about the equation. It's, about, it's, 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 a, it's a notation that indicates something. And it symbolizes a lot. The whole thing, well, very nice symbol. If I understand this, and if I understand this, I should understand this, and I should understand this. Because if I understand this, it's just put this into this, and there you are. So you don't have to memorize all that stuff, as long as you see the relationships. Uh, so it depends. And that's what I'm saying, that diagrams are tool for learning in the classroom. Because if we help the students to make sense of those, uh, of the relationship, how they are similar, how they are different, how we can differentiate, and, and that's what these people call, I love the term, to differentiate, you differentiate and you integrate, but you differentiate in the sense of you make difference, you compare and contrast, and then you say like, okay, is this really similar or different or what? You make a judgment. That's what Kant says. You make a judgment. You compare and contrast, and then you decide. I, I love the human circle. Because for me, the human circle is there. That's all I give to them. This is so my help. Because they say, do I have to memorize it? I say, if you want to, it's your choice. But you don't have to, really. Because if you want to see that, you can see all the angles in there. Now, you are interested in the least faster quaternal angle. Now, if you are there, by the way, there is a, a right triangle that is going, because of the nature of the x, y axis, there are right uh, triangles that are going to hit you in the face. You know? So you can find the reference angle, and you can defend yourself with that. 
but you have to conclude. And there are the symmetries in there. What symmetry do you want to see? And uh, that is a diagram. Uh, so, and I give that to them since the beginning, like, okay, we are going to make sense of the xy axis. And there is a lot that we can make sense of the xy axis that they don't realize and that they do not know. Just to find the coordinates. I mean, a point is a point in the xy axis, like, oh, that point. Yeah, but it's very tricky. Because that point, yeah, it has to do coordinates. You are seeing this, correct? Because I'm directing you to see that point. But it's telling you two things. That distance, the first coordinate. That distance, there's a distance hidden in there. Now, you want to see it or not, and they just look at the board. And uh, I, I love another thing that I think that is when you see the misconceptions, when they find the domain of the function, it could be a trigonometric function or an irrational function, and they find the vertical asymptotes. So they see that they found all the x's that they have was false through the domain because they are not good, they are going to bring you the denominator zero. And then they say, will you please come here, help me make the vertical lines, okay? And they compute that value with the vertical line, that's in like a small detail. You are computing one point with infinitely many points, you know? Because what you are considering is that value, the first point, as being the first coordinate of all sets of points that you want to form the vertical line. So, or you tell me that is the line, or you give me all the all the co the coordinates, or the or the order pairs, uh, and they confuse that, and we confuse them because even when we give them something written, we say vertical asymptote x equals something. We confuse them. Um, there is always the process of interpretation. For me, that's the big secret between teaching and learning. We go there, we have our sense of strength, that's how I interpret. I tell them how I should be interpreted. I never ask myself, how do they interpret that? Do we? Like, we don't have time for that, you know? And besides that, since, since that they pay me for what they, uh, not for what they understand, only because I go there and fulfill my time. You see? So there is no problem with me. And we never ask ourselves, what are the students interpreting? It's not that they know or they don't know. They know something. What is what they know and how we can help them to grow into the knowledge that they have, to see relationships. And um, are diagrams conceptualizing tools? And I say, yes, the evolving perceptual and mental transformations of diagrams co-emerge with the formation of new interpreters in the mind of the interpreters and with their progressive inferential reasoning process. Progressive. This means a progression in the conceptualization of the deep structure of the mathematical object that diagrams purport to represent. So diagrams is a means. They mediate, but they don't do it all. In order to mediate, somebody else has to be on the other side trying to get there, you know. Uh, it goes without saying that when working with diagrams, the interpretants generated by different interpreters, although somewhat similar in nature, may have different iconic indexical and symbolic features according to their personal conceptualizing structures and the level of sophistication of their mathematical thinking. So when we say, oh, we, we understand all the fact that we are fine, but well, we are fine, but we don't know what we are talking about because you are fine in your way and fine in my way. But it's very similar, so we are just fine right now. Uh, this clearly indicates that teachers need to develop two simultaneous and parallel types of awareness. One, awareness of the teacher own evolving interpretations of transformant diagrams, and second, awareness of the student's interpretation of those diagrams. This double awareness 
on the part of the teachers will enable the guidance of the students by using the students' current interpretations and understanding. It's trying to meet them where they are, not trying to push them to meet us where we are. That's how I are. And in this sense, uh, it's in this sense that diagram serves as tools of meaning making, as epistemological tools for teachers and students alike, although such a meaning could be at different but compatible levels of understanding. And <coughs> diagrammatic. I realize there's not a clock in here. I just wanted to give you to, uh, make you aware that it's 407. So I don't know how many more slides you have. Oh no, that's the last one. Because I know some people had some commitments. So. Okay, a diagram is a diagram to somebody only if intentional interpreting. A diagram is a diagram for who and for what. Diagrammatic reasoning does not happen without one's intentional and progressive cycles of interpretation while interacting with others in the classroom or in the world in general. Diagrammatic reasoning unleashes process of perception and intellectual observation. It intertwines the thought elements in perception and the perceptual elements in thought. Diagrammatic reasoning sets in motion thought experimentation and habits of thinking and diagrammatic reasoning and lacks processes of overcoded, undercoded and creative abduction. It also unlocks processes of induction and deduction. Uh, it sets in motion the interlocked semiotic systems that constitute the classroom semiotic reality of teaching and learning. That is something that we work very hard, really, in a, before it's like the cover of a book. And like, what is this semiotic system in the classroom? And what then is what this interlock? It's listening, it's speaking, it's reading, it's writing, it's thinking, it's interpreting, and all of them in all their combinations. Very dramatic things. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank again Dr. Science Ludlow for coming and visiting us and joining us again in Athens. It was a little chilly this morning, but it warmed up this <laughs> afternoon. Um, but thank you again for sharing this wonderful um, talk with us and thinking about semiotic and diagrammatic, diagrammatic reasoning. There is a, um, for those that have a little bit of time can stick around, you can ask some more one-on-one -on -one follow-up questions. Um, for those that need to leave, you can go and fulfill those other commitments. But thank you again for coming and let's just give one more round of hands.